but I think we did a few examples of this just represented the, where we call this the, this is the prime factorization theorem or prime expansion for your homework. You're asked to identify the prime factorization of, I think, five different, uh, or of a, a few different numbers, right? you're also asked to identify prime and composite numbers, five of each. Right? The uh, prime factorization or prime expansion of numbers is simply the product of the primes that compose that particular number. Right? So for example, 512 is product of primes. Note that this product also uniquely identifies the numbers. Right? This is two times two times two, nine different times. I think this is the example we ended our last class on. Right? It's simply two to the nine. Right, 14 equal 2 times 7. Right, this uniquely identifies 14. No other number has right, is equal to 2 times 7, just 14. Right, and 13 right, can be written as just 13. We as 13 is prime. All right, a few other notes here. All right, uh, another important theorem, this is particularly useful when checking for factors or checking to see whether a number is prime or not. If n is composite, right, but if n is not prime, and right, then n has a prime factor that is less than or equal to the square root of n. Right. So if the, square root of n, if the square root of n is an integer, right, then the square root of n itself is a, a factor, and it may or may not be a prime factor. Right. Right. If n has a factor, right, and it's less than the square root of n, right, then the number with which you need to multiply that factor by such that the product is equal to n would have to be greater than the square root of n, right, and vice versa. So for every factor there is greater than the square root of n, there must also be one less than the square root of n, right, such that the product would be equal to n, right. This can be simply be seen if you have two numbers greater than the square root of n and you multiply them together, it's gonna to be greater than n. The square root of n times the square root of n is equal to n. So if you take two numbers greater than the square root of n, multiply them together, it's going to be greater than n. And similarly, if the two factors are less than the square root of n, if you multiply them together, the product will be less than n itself. Right, this is useful as it will allow us to reduce our search for factors of a particular number. I think for one of your assignments or one of the exercises we did in class, you're asked to identify whether a number is prime. Right. I think many of you produced a solution right, where you searched the numbers 2, 3, 4, all the way up to n minus 1 to see if each of those numbers divided right, uh, the number in question. Right. If one of them divided the number evenly, then the number was not prime. Right. This is bringing a bell. Right. Yeah. So now, given this theorem here, we see that we need only search the numbers 2, 3, 4, all the way up to the square root of n. So we could have stopped that search a lot sooner, saved a lot of time in that search. And so this allows us to be a bit more efficient in searching for factors, right? Note that we could also reduce our search if we had a list of primes to simply just search prime numbers between two and the square root of n, the number under question. And so if we had such a list, a list of prime numbers between two and the square root of n, we could very quickly search to see if n was prime, or at least quick relative to the brute force approach where we just checked every single number between two and n minus one. All right, so if we, we can apply this and see how useful this might be, right, we can show, right, show that 31 is prime. Right, note that we need only search the prime numbers between 2 and the square root right, of 31. Right. Well, we know that the square root of 36 is equal to 6, so let's search from 2 till 6. 6 isn't prime anyway, so we can ignore 6. So we'll go from 2 to 5, the prime numbers between 2 and 5, right? Does 2 divide 31? Nope. Does not divide 31. Right. The next prime number, 3, does 3 divide 31? No. Right. 4 is not prime, right? So there's 2 times 2, 4 divided 31. Anyways, 2 would have divided 31. Right. We need only check the next prime number, which is 5. 5 does not divide 31. 
right? We've searched all of the prime numbers between two and the square root of n, right? None of them divided 31, therefore n is prime, or 31 is prime. Another important and interesting fact of the primes, right? The set of all primes is infinite. Oh. And we'll go ahead and prove this. Right? So we'll use a proof strategy very similar to some of the proof strategies, proof by contradictions that we've used before. Right, before we prove this, we'll do a side note and we'll simply prove that the natural numbers are infinite. Right, previously in this class, we simply defined the set of the natural numbers to be countably infinite, but we didn't necessarily prove formally that the natural numbers are infinite, we just defined them to be infinite. Right, we can prove this quite easily by using a proof by contradiction. We'll sort of informally, informally sketch out the proof and rely on a few principles that we haven't formally discussed, right, but I think the proof will be really intuitive either way. Right. So side note, and so we'll, we'll put this proof here on, on the side and we'll just prove that the natural numbers are infinite. And I think understanding the flow of this proof will help us understand the flow of proving that the primes are infinite. We'll do this proof by contradiction. And many proofs of this nature are proofs by contradiction. And then trying to, in a closed form fashion, deal with infinite sets and showing that something is infinite is hard to do in a closed form direct fashion. So it's almost always easier to use an indirect approach. Proof by contradiction works out well in many cases. All right. So we're going to start off by contradicting this statement we're trying to prove. Simply, we're going to assume that n is finite. And we're going to use a similar logic we use for the Cantor's diagonalization. Since it's finite, then we can list out all the elements in this set. So what we're going to do here, as we do in many proofs, proofs by contradiction of this nature, is we're going to list out an exhaustive list of all of the elements in this set, the set of the natural numbers. And then we're going to create a natural number that's not in our list, thus reaching a contradiction. At this time, creating this number is going to be pretty easy. Right? Uh, with our prime numbers, it's going to be a little bit more, a little bit more tricky. We'll have to be a little bit more clever. But here it's pretty pretty straightforward. Right, so assume n is finite. Right? What does that mean? That means that there exists an n such that the cardinality of n right, is equal to n. So we have n elements. Right? There exists some n. It's finite. We can count the elements. There's n of them. Right, so we can list them out. And so we can write them out as, say, x1, x2, right, x3, dot, 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 xn. And furthermore, right, and we can use this as a side note, since the non-negative integers are ordered, are well-ordered, we can put them in order. Right? That is, we can order the integers using the less than relation. Right? That is, one is less than two, right, is less than three, is less than four. So if we have a set of integers here, right, using this, this concept of knowing that the non-negative integers are well-ordered, and you can put them in order, the first element, there's also a last element. That means there's a max element so let's go ahead and, and order this list. Let's assume that we have this list in order, where x1 is the minimum element, right, and x10 is the maximum element. Oops. x1, 2, x3, dot, 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 xn, right, list, this is a list of n elements of n, right? This is our exhaustive list, right? We know that there's n of them, or there exists some n such that there's n of them, right? n elements, so n elements of n, in order, right? By our, we'll just say, using our less than operator, right? So how can we create an integer 
that's not in this list. And you have a list of n elements. How can we create an integer that's not in this list? Well, if xn is the max element, right? if xn is the max element, exactly. Right? Using the fact that 1 plus an integer is in fact an integer, right? if we believe that to be true, right? then the number y equals xn plus 1 right? must be an integer. Right. However, since x in was the maximum element in our list, and we defined it to be that way, right? x in plus 1 is not in our list. Right. So we can just say simply y is not in our list. Right. Not just any list, it's our exhaustive list, right? It's not in our exhaustive list. So thus we've created an element, right? If, if our set was of size n, we found an element that was not in that list of size n, so we've reached a contradiction. Right? Therefore, our premise was flawed, right? So the set of natural numbers is not, right? is not finite, therefore it is infinite. All right, so we're going to use uh, logic very similar to this to show that there are infinitely number uh, an infinite number of primes. So again, we'll go back to our, our primes here, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a little break after this. All right. We'll say the primes are infinite, proof by contradiction. And since we'll do a proof by contradiction, we'll assume that we have a finite set of primes. And assume primes are finite. All right, so then we'll reach a contradiction. All right, since if we assume that the primes are finite, this means we can list them out. And so we have P1. Right, there exists some n such that the, the cardinality of this set is n, so we'll have n primes, p1, p2, dot, 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 and up to pn. So it's finite. Right? There's a first element and an nth element. There's a last element, but it's finite. All right, so now we are tasked with constructing a number that, that is prime, right? that is not in this list. And this is a little bit more complex than with our integers. Right, this one we have to rely upon our fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Right, and so we will create right a number using these primes, right, such that it, that number must have a factor that is not in our list of primes. Right, very cleverly we will construct this Q. as follows, and Q will be this number. Q will simply be equal to the product of all of these primes, so P one right, times P two. Times all the way out to Pn plus 1. All right, we can write this more concisely as simply the product right, from i to 1 to n of Pi, right, and then plus 1. All right. Now, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, there exists a prime factor of Q. It might only be Q itself, right? But there exists a, at least one prime factor, right? Q is either a product of two or more primes, or it is a prime itself, right? By the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And so, recalling the fundamental theorem, right? Right, there must exist a prime, we'll call it pj, it's right, such that 
pj divides q. Right? Again, pj might be q itself, right? or some prime factor of q. But there exists, there must exist at least one pj. I'm going to go ahead and leave this there and just erase the top part here. Again, note that we've constructed this Q such that it includes a product of all of our prime numbers, an exhaustive product plus one. Yeah. So, it's yes, it is the product of all primes plus one. All right, so let's look at Q again. So again, Q is equal to Q1, Q2, dot, 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 P, N, plus one. All right, there must exist some PJ that divides it. All right, so with these two pieces of information, we have a contradiction. Why? Well, if PJ divides Q, right? right PJ must be in this list because this list is exhaustive. So PJ will clearly divide this portion, right? It's just a product of a whole bunch of primes plus PJ. Again, assuming PJ is in this list, right? So this will divide evenly, right? Does that make, is that clear to everyone? It's a product of prime numbers. If PJ is one of these prime numbers, it will divide the product of all of these prime numbers, right? However, in order to divide Q, right, it must also divide this as well. The only number that divides one is one. One is not prime, and we've reached a contradiction. And in order for PJ to divide Q, right, PJ either needs to divide one or PJ is not in this list. Right. Right. PJ must, cannot be in this list, right? But this list was exhaustive, so we've reached a contradiction. And so if PJ, again, if PJ divides Q, then PJ cannot be, be in our list of primes. And so in a sense, very indirectly here, note that Q isn't necessarily prime in this example. It may be prime, it might not be. In this example, we've sort of indirectly constructed a prime, pj, such that pj was not on the list. And so we've reached our contradiction. Therefore, we have an infinite number of prime numbers. And although there are an infinite number of them, we are in constant search of prime numbers. Some of them are easier to check than others. And although we can constrain the search by searching the prime numbers up to the square root of some number n, right, to see if it is a factor of n, right, uh, there are another set, a very popular set of prime numbers called Mersenne primes. Um, And so Mersenne primes, named after Marin Mersenne, a uh, French mathematician, not really a mathematician, more of a, a clergyman who dabbled in number theory and acoustics, and that many have labeled him as the father of acoustics. So it's Marin Mersenne, and it's Mersenne primes are primes. Of the form. Two to the p minus one, and where p is prime. Hmm. 
Note that any number two to the p minus one where p is prime is not necessarily prime, but rather a Mersenne prime is a prime number that is in this form. These two statements are very different. It is conjectured that there are an infinite number of Mersenne primes. However, this is an open problem and it's never been shown to be true. All right, examples of Mersenne primes, like the number three, it is equal to two to the two minus one. Is the most same prime. Like the number seven. Also the most same prime. Right. Notice that two to the two to the um, two to the five. What is right, two to the five? Two to the four. Two to the four. You can check it. And I don't think two to the five is prime. Two to the eight. Two to the sixteen. Oh, it is 31. Yeah, it is Mersenne. Right? And this pattern will stop eventually, though. Let's see, 2 to the 7 minus 1. What do we got there? Is that 127? 127 is divisible by 3. Okay. Yeah? 127. What is 127 divisible? We can see if that's Mersenne as well. But let's load it up. Let's check. I have a list of all the Mersenne primes here. So there's a constant search of Mersenne primes. As I noted in our last lecture, right, uh, the Mersenne primes um, are an interesting set of primes in that the test to see whether they are a, a number of this, of this format is prime is very, very fast, very efficient as compared to checking just the general case of a number to see whether it's prime. Right, the test is called the, the Lucas-Lemmer test, right, and it relies upon some of the, the theories and properties uh, related to primes and, and the number theory in general that we've been talking about. And so relative to, again, a general checking to see whether a number of any form is prime, right? checking a Mersenne number to see whether it's a Mersenne prime is relatively very fast. And just two months ago in January, right, they found a new Mersenne number. Let's go to the home here and see it. Yes. Can you guys see that at all? A little bit. Uh, in Mersenne.org. Oh, there it goes. Uh oh, no. There it is. You can almost see it. So, in January 7, 2016, right, the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search, right, so there is a huge sort of effort underway, right, by many persons using many computers, right. The number of people now participating in this search right, is over here. 154,000 users, over a million CPUs, and a lot of teraflops in action, a lot of gigahertz days in action. Searching for prime just this January, this number here was found to be prime, where 74 million, et cetera, is prime. Right, this particular number is quite large. Right? It's, it's, it's quite inconceivable, actually, how large this number is. Right, I think it's they've worked it out yet. So it has 22 million digits, over 22 million digits, to think about how large this number is. Again, to put this into scale, how large this number is, I think the order of number of particles in the known universe, they estimate to be around like 2 to the 100, 2 to the 300. There's like 2 to the 74 million in something, minus 1. Right? Really big number. Shockingly, they were able to test to see whether this number is prime. Clearly, they didn't check every single number between 2 and this number. Right, to see whether this number is prime. They didn't even check all the numbers between two and the square root of this number to see whether this number is prime. Luckily, again, there is another test. Given the, the even the, the speed and efficiency of the lucas lemmer test, it took, I believe, 57 days just to check to see whether this one number was prime or not. We can sort of check all of these things here. So here are the known primes. Let's see. Right, two to the seven e's. Yeah, so that one is a Mersenne prime as well. Right, so this search for Mersenne prime started all the way back in 500 BC. The search continues. Thus far, we've got 49 of what we assume to be an infinite set of primes. Note that all of the numbers here that have been found aren't necessarily sequential. There may be some gaps here. We have not checked sequentially, obviously, to see whether these numbers are prime or not. Here's sort of a graph of 
the prime numbers and when they've been found according to year. So here are some of the latest ones. It had been about two years since the last Mersenne was found, and even two years before that since the, right, the one before that was found. Right. Interestingly, this one was found, at least credit was given for January of this year. Right, this, the, uh, the GIMPS program was running on a server at the University of Missouri, so just checking a whole bunch of numbers, and the computer actually found this to be a prime number in September, right? and, and so it stored that information. However, and they, uh, I think they had set up an auto email system, right? That failed, right? So everyone was supposed to get an email to to be updated and, and aware that Emerson was Emerson Prime had been found. However, the email was never sent out, and so four months later, after the the uh, the, the person managing sort of the server for the department was doing a little house cleaning, noticed that there was an output file that was outputted by this GIMP program running. Search the file to find that, that it had identified it in the same time. So four months later, they were actually aware of the, the discovery. Um, but as you can see here, it's it's pretty fun to just sort of see this and see how many people are going after this, you know, sort of contributing to this search and of uh, of crimes here. And the search is ongoing. If you were to find a prime number, either using the software or, or any other that has not been found but is a more same crime, I think the award is around $3,000. Yeah. Yeah, crimes in general are used for uh, encryption, encryption, and so we'll talk about uh, some more applications. We talked about hash functions, which is you know, more applications of modulars. Um, but on when we get back from break, we'll talk about ciphers, encryption, RSA encryption. Right? These many encryption schemes make use of prime numbers, and, and not just that large prime number, which so makes them harder to encrypt and, and guess, uh, guess ways to have. All right, so we'll go ahead and take a two, three minute break, and we will continue on with the Euclidean algorithm, and then we'll look at integer representation. And that should wrap us up. All right. All right. So continuing on with uh, some more number theory here, we'll discuss the concept of greatest common divisors and least common multiples. I think each of you have been exposed to these concepts a little bit more. We'll try to formalize it 
uh, maybe a little bit more tightly than uh, in your first introduction to these concepts. Talk about the Euclidean algorithm, how and why we can use that to find the greatest common divisors and least common divisors. All right, so first we'll define the greatest common divisor. Right, we'll let A and B be non-zero integers. Right, then D, right, the largest D, such that D divides A and B, that is the largest factor of both A and B, is called the greatest common divisor of A and B. Right? And we write that out as GCD of A and B, greatest common divisor. Note that two numbers are considered to be relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is one. That is, they share no common factors. Right, save one. Let's do an example. Did you guys finish writing that? And we'll do an example of finding greatest common divisors. Let's find the greatest common divisor of 48 and 84. So let's find GCD 48 and 84. Right. It helps for a number of reasons to write out the prime factorization of each of these numbers to determine the greatest common divisor. And otherwise, you might just be searching in your mind, trying to search and find factors haphazardly. Right, but rather, writing out the prime factors will allow us to get to a solution uh, much more quickly. And so we can write out 84 using its unique prime factorization. And is equal to 2 to the 2 times 3 times 7. And that's 21 times 4. Right. And we also have 48 is equal to 2 to the 4 times 3. Two, two, yeah. and 16 times 3, yeah, 48. <coughs> Right, so the GCD again is the largest D. Right, right that divides both. Right, so we have the largest D that divides 84, and D divides 48. All right, well, let's just look at the prime factorization here. We can see here that, well, Look, we can see here clearly that 3 divides both of these numbers. Right? 3 is a factor for both of these numbers. So we found a factor, or we found a D. Right? It's not the largest D, but it is a D that divides both. Right? We can also see that 2 divides both. Right? We can even go further to say that 2 to the 2 divides both. Right? By looking at right, this prime factorization. We can see here that 7 divides 84, right? but not 48. All right, so what's the largest number that will divide both? Well, we see that 4 divides both, and we see that 3 divides both. So 12 will divide both. And that is the largest. Right? So we have D equal to 2 to the 2 times 3, and it will clearly divide both. I note here in a more general sense, given this observation, right. Right. I think it was pretty clear how, how helpful it was to sort of write out the prime factorization to find the greatest common divisor. Writing out the prime factorization allowed us to identify all of the prime factors, right? The most prime factors are the product of all the prime factors that are shared between the two values, right? It was the largest factor between the two of them, the greatest common divisor. Right, so in a general sense, we can write this out mathematically as follows. Right, if we write the unique prime factorization of each number, A and B, such like this, right, we'll order the primes, we'll say P1, and then I'll say A to the 1, just indicating the superscript of prime number 1, right, describing value A, or number A. And so P1, A to the 1, P2, A to the 2. Right, the superscripts here are just these superscripts here, right, like 2, 1, or 1. Right, this one was 4 and 1. That's a P1, P2, 
and P3, A sub 3, and then dot, dot, dot. And in general, we'll have N primes, A sub N. And you can also write out B the same way. Note here we're going to use the same primes. I'll say Y in a moment, B1. And prime number 2 with some superscript B to the 2. And 3, B to the 3. Dot, 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 P to the N. And note here we can assume that they share a product of all these primes simply because we have the superscripts there. Like for example, although 7 doesn't divide 48, we could always say that this is times 7 right to the 0, make this superscript 0, thus reducing that factor just to 1. And so we can always write two numbers as a product of similar primes as long as we have exponents that we can zero out. Right. Given that we know that each number, A and B, has a unique prime factorization, right, we can now define the result of GCD of A and B in terms of this prime factorization. Right, it's simply equal to P to the 1 times, well, what did we do? Right, we essentially identified right, the largest exponent right, that is shared by both numbers, which is the minimum exponent for each of the primes across each of the numbers. And so this is P to the 1 to the min of A1 comma B1 right, times P2 to the min of A2 and B2. Right, and then dot, dot, dot all the way up to Pn to the min of a n comma b n. Right again here we can see here that we have all of the mins, right? We took they both have a prime factor of two. We took the min exponent. Right? They each had a prime factor of one or three, right? So both of them had an exponent of one, just one. Right? Both of them had a prime factor of seven in a sense. Right? So we took the min of the superscript one and zero though. We just zeroed it out. And that was the result for this, and without loss of generality, this is true, right, for all A and B. One other interesting fallout of, of GCDs, one interesting quality which will segue or lead us into the Euclidean algorithm, right, is the following property of notes. Like that if we have any two integers, a and b, we can write out the following equation, right, given our definition of right, the modulus and divides operators. Right, we have a is equal to b times some quotient plus some remainder. And that is, if we divide a by b, we get some quotient and some remainder. And again, given a and B are integers. And therefore, we have the following recurrence in a sense. And that is GCD of A comma B, the greatest common divisor of A and B is equal to the greatest common divisor B and R, the remainder. This has to do with the fact that this is a remainder and therefore is a difference. Right? The factor must also divide, the greatest factor must also divide uh, R as well to the greatest effect and the greatest final um, factor. But note that this is a recurrence. R is defined in terms of both A and B. Right? And so we can generalize this concept in terms of an algorithm. And in fact, this is the concept underlying the Euclidean algorithm. I am missing.
Right, we'll go ahead and write it out as pseudocode. So our procedure we'll call GCD, right, the greatest common divisor of two integers. And we'll assume A and B are positive integers. First, we define a few temporary variables. Then we have the following recurrence. While y is not equal to zero, we divide a by b, get a remainder, and then compute the GCD of b and the remainder and repeat until we get an even division, right? Until y is equal to zero, indicating that we have an even division and we have found a common factor, the largest common factor. And so here we will compute the remainder. And again, we repeatedly right, divide x by y, identify the remainder. We keep doing this until the remainder is zero, thus indicating that we found a factor of both x and y. And I encourage you to try a few examples stepping through. In fact, this reminds me, I sent out an announcement and an email, I think you guys have probably seen, uh, concerning sets of practice problems, practice questions from each of the sections related to material we've covered in the class. I think you guys have seen that. So I, I remember selecting a few. There were a few of those that had you guys sort of step through this algorithm, right? Computing the GCD of two different number theorems by just stepping through the algorithm, seeing how it works and why it works. So I encourage you guys to, to of course, check out those uh, sample problems. I sort of went through and just handpicked some that seemed really co aligned with the stuff we've been covering in class. And it was about 10 from each section, which I think is a good set to practice. All right, last, lastly, before we get to our integer representation, we'll do the least common multiple. And so LCM is the least common multiple. And again, A and B are integers. Is smallest. We see here. Easy. It's so the least common multiple of integers A and B. Right? Is the smallest multiple c, the smallest integer c, such that a divides both, I'm sorry, that both a and b divide c, that is a divides c and b divides c. But again, to determine the least common multiple of two numbers, it helps to write out the prime factorization of the numbers. And so let's say that we are asked, right, we'll do an example, we find LCM of and 24 and 22. And so we'll go ahead and write out the prime factorizations of these. 24 equal to, what is that, 2 to the 3 times 3? Right. 3 times 3. Right. What's the prime factorization of 22? Right. 2. Right, 2 and 11. All right. And so when we were looking at this from the greatest common divisor standpoint, we wanted to identify the largest product of factors that were shared between the two numbers. Right, however, when we want to find the least common multiple, we want to identify the smallest product of factors right, that will divide our multiple, that will be our C. Right. So let's take a look, let's say, 
All right, so what number will divide both of these here? Right. Well, if we pick right, something that's 2 to the 3 times 3 times 11, right, it should be clear that 24, right, or this number here, and 22, or this number here, will evenly divide this number here. And so this is our least common multiple. It's, this is 264, I think, when you multiply that. Right, our note here that we can, in the general case, identify the least common multiple in a similar way that we were able to identify the greatest common divisor. Right, the relationship right, between the divides is just changed. Right, rather than finding the factor right, that divides both, we want to find the multiple that is divided by both our numbers. Right, so rather than taking a minimum across the exponents of each of the primes, we want to take a maximum. And so if we write out A and B, Again, as P1, A1, is P2, A2, dot, 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 P, N, A, N. And then we write out B similarly. Or you can say that the LCM of A and B Right, is equal to the product of these primes while taking the maximum across their exponents. And so max of A1, B1, right, times P2, max of A2, B2, right, dot, 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 Pn, Max of a n, b n. Right, and the result of this product will be clearly divisible by both right of these numbers here if we construct like this LCM in this fashion. Also of note and of consequence, we can compute the least common multiple using the Euclidean algorithm as well. Even though the Euclidean algorithm gives us the greatest common divisor, we can use that information to find the least common multiple. All right. Given these notes, right, and with a little bit of investigation, you will see that the result is this following theorem. That if we have two integers a and b, right, their product is equal to or GCD times right, their LCM. Again, one of them you're taking the min across the exponents, one of them you're taking the max test. Here. And therefore, you could solve for the LCM using right, the Euclidean algorithm, which will give you the GCD. Any questions about greatest common divisors or least common multiples and before we proceed to integer representation? Well, we can simply use the Euclidean algorithm, which will give us the GCD, right? And then divide the results by, or we could do, for example, LCM. Right, is then equal to A times B over GCD, right, of A and B. Right, the Euclidean algorithm is very efficient, so it's probably, it's probably the, fast way to, the fastest way to do it there. Right, don't quote me on that.
All right. All right, so we will go ahead and dive into integer representation. And again, this is something you've very likely been exposed to before. We'll try to formalize the concept a little bit and pull up, polish off the edges here. And so generally speaking, in society, we use numbers that are base 10, assume base 10. So generally, we use or represent numbers represented in base 10. And so for example, if I wrote the number 365, right, I'll go ahead and put a subscript 10 here to just explicitly note we mean base 10. Right? This is 365. Right? We call this digit here right, the ones digit. Right. That's what I call it. You, is that what you guys call it? Right. I think it's pretty common to call it that. Right. We call this the tens digit. Right. And we call this the hundreds digit. Right. That's not um, haphazard. Right. This is on purpose. This is because right, 3 times 100 plus 6 times 10 plus five times one is equal to 365. And the fact that we write it out as 365 is you know, it's just how we write it out in base 10. These are just symbols to represent the single digits between zero and nine. And we have these, these 10 digits between zero and nine because we work with base 10. <clears throat> okay. But however, in computer science, it is quite useful to work in bases that are multiples of two. And actually, before we get to that, it's important to note, I've got to go in too fast here, got to step back here a moment. It's important to note right, that all integers, right, in, and we'll just do positives now, right, the negatives, you can use negatives. Right, so for in an integer, we'll call b the base, and we can represent all n uniquely. Right. As the following expression, the, follow, the following uh, polynomial expression. Right. Here we will denote our coefficients with uh, the variable alpha and we'll count them all. So this is alpha sub k times b to the k, right, again, where b is our base, plus alpha sub k minus 1 times b to the k minus 1. Okay. The superscript here is an exponent, right, plus dot, 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 all the way down to the k minus first term in this expression, where we have a sub 0 times b to the 0. I note that our, our polynomial expansion of 365 fits this form. Here we had base 10, so 10 is our base. Right here, 3 was our alpha, right, number 2. 6 was our alpha number 1, and 5 was our alpha number 0. Again, in this expansion, 10 was always our base. Right? The exponents change as you go from the, the ones digit or the first digit to the tens digit, the hundreds digit. Right? It's the tens digit, though, because it's base 10. Right, it's the hundreds digit because it's base 10. Base 10 to a 2 is 100, and so on and so forth. And any, any questions about this expansion? Note, though, of course, that this can be done for any B, any base. Right? We can have numbers of any base. We can write numbers in base 9, base 13, base a million, whatever you like. Right, note that if you have base 10, then you're going to need 10 digits to represent, to have single digits. And then once you hit your base, you carry over into two digits. Right, so since we're in base 10, we have 10 digits to represent right, to sort of uh, each column or each coefficient here. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 9, 10 digits. 
like to represent the numbers between 0 and B, the base minus 1. Okay. And in computer science, it's quite convenient to work in bases that are multiple of 2. And specifically, we use base 2. Okay. We call this binary. Right, we use base 8, we call this octal. We also use base 16, and we call this hexadecimal. And sometimes just hex for short. And in base 2 representations, we need two digits to represent each individual coefficient, whether we're talking about the ones digit, or the twos digit, or the fours digit, or the eights digit. In base eight, we need eight characters to represent each coefficient. And so we're going to need a zero through seven right, for, the eight, for the ones digit, a zero through seven for the eights digit, a zero through seven for the sixty-fourths digit, right, and so on and so forth. And let's do some examples here to write out these expansions. Yes. Right. What is, generally, and we'll ask what is the decimal representation because this is how we communicate numbers. We always use decimal. So I'll, I'll, whenever I ask you what is the value of this expression, I'll generally just say what's the decimal representation of, of this non-decimal number. So what is the decimal <coughs> right, representation of, and here we'll do a binary example. So we have 0011, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero. Here we'll put a 2 here, subscript 2 to indicate that we're dealing with base 2. Again, here note that since we have base two, right, we only have two possible you know, characters or symbols for each coefficient. So it can either be zero or one. And given our definition of our polynomial expansion, right, for any integer n given a base b, right, we can represent this as, and we'll just skip the first two digits here because they're zero, so we're going to multiply zero times some number. Right here, we're starting at the zero. Digit the first, right? So this is the zeroth, the first, the second, the third, the fourth. This is the fifth digit. And so we can write this out as one times two, which is our base to the five. Plus, and now we'll do this digit here, one times two to the four. And this one here is a zero, plus zero times two to the three plus 1 times 2 to the 2, plus 1 times 2 to the 1, plus 0 times 2 to the 0. And our zeros here, cancel out, is 0. And 2 to the 5 is 32, I believe. 2 to the 4 is 16. And 2 to the 2, all right, this is just zero. Two to the two is four. Two to the one is two. And then this is zero. And if we add these up, we get 40, 50, 54. Base time. Again, all of these are base time, obviously. It's always a good idea. Whenever you're going back and forth from representations, it's always a good idea to keep track of the base. All right, so this binary string represents the number 54. All right, let's do uh, another example. We'll do an octal example. So here I'll ask again, what is 1, 6, 7, in base 8. Note here, of course, that you can only, since we have base 8, we're only using digits 0 to 7. 
right? As soon as we hit eight, we carry over to the eighths digit, right? right? So the value of eight, for example, is simply this, right? That is eight. There's one in the eighths digit and zero in the ones digit. This is what eight looks like in base eight, right? In general, if you have a base B, right, this is equal to B. And in base 10, of course, this is 10. All right. So what is 167, right, in base 8? So again, we can expand this out. And using our polynomial expansion, we have 1 times 8 to the 2 plus 6 times 8 to the 1 plus 7 times 8 to the 0. And this is equal to 64 plus 48 plus 7. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's 119. An example of octal, have you uh, you guys uh, go into Unix machines from time to time, right, the class server? Like the, uh, the permissions are are sort of uh, coded in octal. So if you ever do an ls-l, you can see the permissions of all the files. Like you'll see they're, they're in octal form. Right? There's a read, write, and execute. Right? Each one can be 0 or 1. There's three of them, so there's only eight different options. You can change the permissions by writing in an octal code right? if you want to change the permission of the file in Unix. Okay, the last one, we'll do a hex example. I think that'll be good for the day. So what is, so hex is a little bit different because, well, our base is 16. So what does this mean? This means we need 16 symbols to represent zero to 15. So we don't have, at least using our basic number system, we don't have a single digit to represent 10, to represent 11, to represent 12, or we use two digits because we're in base 10. But as soon as we hit 10, we carry over to the 10th digit. Base 16, we need single digits to represent everything up to 15. Right? So we use our alpha character. So 10 is represented as an A, and 11 is represented as a B, right? and so on, so 12 is C, right? all the way up to F, representing 15. Right, so when we ask what is, and here's a particular example, one, three, A, F. Right, A is the value 10, F is the value 15. And you can write like a little key to keep that straight. A equals 10, B equals 11. C, D. And here we're just writing on the left hand side is our hexadecimal representation of the number, and on the right hand side is the decimal representation of the number. And so writing this out, determining what this is, again, this is base 16, hexadecimal. You can write out this number using our polynomial expansion. So we have 1 times right, 16, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 16 to the 3 plus 3 times 16 to the 2, plus, right, A is 10, 10 times 16 to the 1, plus 15 times 16 to the 0. And with a little bit of arithmetic, now we get, I think, feel free to check me, 5,039. And so places in memory, and in computer science, will often represent memory or bytes using uh, hexadecimal. As each one of these hexadecimal digits represent four binary numbers, right, or, or a, a binary string of length four. And right, so, for example, 
one 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 in binary is equal to f. And so you can represent a two or an eight digit binary string using two digit hex, for example. Right? And so this is a nice way to consolidate binary strings if the binary string is very long. Rather than having a very long string of zeros and ones, it's generally condensed down to uh, hex of fourth of the number of digits. All right. And so that is, that's it. That is our integer representations. Again, in computer science, we use base 2, base 8, and base 16 a lot. And so we'll focus on those right, for this class. Right. And, uh, and most of, uh, and we're really not going to go much further into it than simply calculating these values via the polynomial expansion. All right. Yeah, if there's no questions, feel free to get outside while the sun is still out there. And uh, enjoy your break. All right, so uh, when we get back from break, homework number six is due. All right, and then the exam is the next lecture, which is going to be the 4th of April. Base 16, the highest you can use. Some sizes just fit only like four binary digits per symbol. Yeah, it is four binary digits per symbol. Uh, you could use others like base W264. It is not common, however. Um, very likely, simply due to the fact that you would have to start memorizing more symbols. Okay? Once you get past F, I think most computer scientists have got A, B, C, D, F, but after that you're going to run out of symbols and you'll have to get a Greek alphabet and then you'll have to remember what all those symbols mean. Yeah. The 32 you could probably still stick with our alphabet. If you went to the 64, you'd have to start using other alphabets. Um, is there any test that uh, When we get back, we'll talk a little bit about some applications such as ciphers and RSA. We've already learned the concepts that underlie them. Um, so we will, but we will learn a little bit of application before. Yeah. 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 Would we be able to apply that by just going through the decimal numbers right now? Yeah. So you could, uh, like for example, if you just had something like, oh, there has to be the well, there's many, I suppose there's many ways to do this. You can do it just directly like this. So for example, if you had 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, something like this. And you can just break this down. This is going to be 3, right? And this is going to be 2, 2, 2, 2, 8, 9. So that's not very, a very fun one. But if we had 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 0, 1, 0, 0, I guess would be F4. Okay, so I remember learning in 051. Okay, it's all flooding back. Okay. Great. All right, yeah, enjoy your break. All right, you too. Thanks.